Hey guys, so today we're going to be demoing one of Sergeant's charcoal drawings. Hopefully you learned something about his technique and it's an enjoyable watch. Let's get right into it. Alright, so <clears throat> to begin with, I'm going to be using sight size, much like my other demo. And if you don't know what sight size is, what it basically is, is referencing whatever you're trying to draw and your drawing and making them the same size. So if I took a measurement right here, then it's going to be the same measurement on my actual drawing. Now, Sergeant employed sight size a lot according to first-hand accounts and also his teacher and careless duran and the method that he taught and a lot of it was mass painting techniques which we'll talk about it relates to drawing as well and then it's also employing that sight size method so as you can see right here i just put in the height of the face according to what the drawing is so you can see right here when i line up all the horizontals they work out and they're proportional so <clears throat> Next, what we're going to do is, now that we have the height in order, we're just going to get a very generalized shape of the head. And I like to just not think about it too much. It's mostly about getting the general proportion correct. So I can see kind of the jaw comes down here, so I'm just going to really simplify that. Getting it in. And for this drawing, I'm going to be using Neutrum Charcoal. They make great charcoal sticks that you can use, and they have this little nice wrap at the bottom where you can hold it. What that does for you is it, it encourages you to not hold it at the tip where you get your fingers dirty. And because you're not getting your fingers dirty down here, it actually forces you to get further away from your drawing. And we'll talk more about that because that was a common trope in Carlos Duran's methods and what Sergeant employed himself was getting and seeing the big picture. So anyway, so we got in a very general head shape. And now we know that the proportion that we just took here height wise is correct so now we're going to see if the proportion right here is correct as well and it is actually pretty much correct so i'm not gonna have to change that a lot and when i'm doing this and i'm measuring it's going to look weird to you guys because my focal point is a little bit different so this is this i can see right now is actually looks more like this for you guys so it's going to be a little bit different. But what I'm doing when I'm measuring, if you're new to drawing, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people doing the, the whole measuring thing with their paintbrush or with their pencil or whatever. What that is, is that you're trying to get a very accurate measurement because drawing is all about accuracy and it's about being proportional. So what happens is that if you're trying to scale up your drawing, for example, you might think about it more mathematically. So if you have the proportion of one to two, let's say the nose to the width of the face is one to two. So this is one unit and then the width is two units, for example, right? Then if I'm trying to scale up my drawing and it's this, it's way bigger, then it still needs to be proportional. So it might end up looking like two and four, right? It's still the same ratio, but it's just blown up a bit. So it might be like one inch to two inches or two inches to four inches, but that's what relative proportions are. And understanding that is really how you get a lot more accurate in your drawings, especially when you're trying to get a likeness. So anyway, we're gonna be thinking about proportions when we're doing this, and then we're also gonna be thinking about shapes and how to design those shapes. So when I'm putting in this kind of underdrawing, it's just getting the gestural idea of what it is. And it's an important concept to learn to make very long, fluid gestural marks at the beginning stages of your drawing because it helps you get a much more fluid drawing at the very end. So, when I'm putting in this chin, I don't really even care if it's entirely correct. It's more important to me to get the, the motion of the face, if that makes total sense. And then once I put in a pretty gestural mark, I'm going to check if that proportion is correct. And it looks like the ear stops right around here, so I'm just going to fix that. And then for the hair, I like just getting the general shape of the head. So if you grab, let's grab a little proportion here for the hair. Looks like the hairline stops around there, and we can check that with our pencil. And for you guys, it would look more like this. That's what it would look like on your own paper. So just making sure that everything lines up. So we're going to check that it's correct. So now I'm going to grab the angle of the hair and I know that the angle 
is at about this degree. So I'm gonna compare that over here, but I'm also smart enough to know, and you are too, obviously, that it's a curve, it's not really an angle. But what you're doing is that you're taking two different points and then you're simplifying it into a straight line. So if I grab a straight line here, bam, and then I can see the angle, then I can put in the more gestural curve. So I make sure that the curve is going in the right direction. It ends up somewhere over here, right? And what you wanna do once you become more proficient at drawing is to just see that angle in your head and then you can actually plot out the curves pretty accurately. But it takes a lot of repetition and that's the same with anything even outside of art. To become proficient at something, it takes three seconds to learn the basics and then a lifetime to really master those because all the work is done intuitively. It's to actually get an understanding of it unconsciously. That's what takes all the work. So right here, I can see that the ear's a bit screwed up. So I'm just gonna get the general shape. Again, not getting too specific in the details. I really just care about the general big masses. And that's what Sargent was known for, was stepping back and forth from his canvas. In fact, the people referencing Carolus Duran's method said that in painting a picture, he would retreat a few steps from the canvas and then once more advance with a brush balanced in his hand. And that's what Sargent was also known for because he was known for going back and forth on his canvas, wearing the carpet thin. So you wanna keep all your shapes really, really generalized. You wanna keep all your sh shapes really simple. And if you do that and you can back up and it looks correct, then you're, you're golden. But if you're, if you're not holding the edge of the pencil, so to say, and you're really, really locked into the drawing, you're gonna screw up the big masses of the drawing. And that's where you really screw up the likeness. Now, another thing that Sargent always said was to keep a plumb line in the hand. And he really liked plumb lines. And what a plumb line was, was something that <clears throat> would dangle down in front of the face of the artist and it'd be just a nice vertical line. And what that would what that would do is that you could plot where things lined up in the vertical direction. So if I put a plumb line right here, for example, on the face, I can see that the edge of the chin lines up with the this part right where it turns over on the eyebrow. Now, if I was drawing and I wasn't using a plumb line and I wasn't checking my angles properly, I could get a little bit confused and I could move this over to the left and this over to the right, and that would screw up the drawing a bit. So what you wanna do when you're drawing is that you wanna check the, the relationship between two different shapes. Because really drawing, and you'll see this a lot more when you become more proficient, it's just a big puzzle of shapes, right? And once you understand that, you can start plotting things a lot more accurately. It's not really, it's not a face, it's not a nose, it's not whatever, it's just, it's just this dead wood that you're smushing around on dead trees. You know, it's like a lot of dead trees involved, but what you're doing is you're mimicking reality using these abstract value shapes, right? And when you think about it that way and you're not thinking about things as literally a face, then you start to see that, that the relationship between these things in a more abstract sense is really what's pushing the drawing accurately. All right, so I can see that the tip of the eyebrow here lines up right around here, and it is exaggerated a bit. Now, Sargent, I'm not sure if he knew anatomy or not. I couldn't find any information on if he was very versed in his anatomy. I think he was just a very accurate drawer. But one of the things that he would do is that he would design his models. And with men especially, the way that their skull is shaped is that their brow curves over a little bit more. So you can notice this, you can grab somebody of your own family, like your mother or you know your sister, if it doesn't matter. Have them have a side profile. And then if you look at the side of their face, it's much smoother. And men usually have this little bump, right? And what and that's just the way that the man, uh, man's skull is shaped. And you can see right here that that little bump is there. So if you missed, if you missed uh, the bump right there, for example, when you were drawing and you didn't really know that that was anatomically important, then what would happen is that he'd look a little bit more feminine. So that's one way to script the likeness. And that's one of the reasons why anatomy is important, although it's not the thing that you should be learning first and foremost. You should learn how to draw first, but anatomy is pretty crucial to design the model. So if Sargent knew that this was a man, he was trying to make a more masculine, imposing, whatever, and he was trying to exemplify those features that made him such, then what he could do is that he could exaggerate that bump and make it a little bit more prominent. Now, we obviously don't know what Sergeant did and didn't do because we can't see the model, but from what I can see here, it does look a bit exaggerated. I don't know if you would really see that that prominent of a tip there, but that's one of the things that Sergeant would do is that he would design his models, albeit to a very low extent. 
compared to some other artists like Leindecker and other illustrators. Now, a lot of people ask, how do you draw hair? How do you draw an eye? How do you draw blah, blah, blah? It doesn't matter how you draw. When you're first starting out, you shouldn't care about how to draw an eye, how to draw hair, all this other stuff. You should care about how to draw everything, right? And the way that you learn how to draw everything is by learning the basic principles of art. Shape, value, lines, all this other stuff. And when you learn that, you can draw anything you want. You can't design anything you want. And that's the next step after you actually learn to draw. But if you can draw, if you know how to how shapes and lines work and how to accurately record those, it's going to look like hair and it's going to look like a face. It really doesn't, you don't need to know the anatomy at that point. Now, if you want to make it look better than reality, then you do need to know a little bit more anatomical knowledge. But if you, if you're going on YouTube, I would not suggest watching the videos of how to draw eyes, for example, like one close up eye, you, that's not going to really be practical to use in anything other than just drawing one eye. You really need to know the basics and then you can learn to draw anything. <clears throat> so hair, for example, is no different than this eye socket. It's just a big, it's just a bunch of value shapes. All right, so now I'm gonna be plotting out the general proportions of the face. So generally speaking, and I talked about this in my other demo, the face is split up into thirds. And that's just a really basic rule that you learn day one of portrait drawing, painting, whatever, depending on if you have a good teacher or not. And that really solves a lot of problems because if you can plot out a general thirds layout, then you can alter it a little bit to get somebody's likeness. So if I look at right here, the eyebrows, and like the nose, generally speaking right there, and then we can use the measuring technique that I talked about earlier. And we can see, yeah, that's pretty much the thirds. So now we can see if the thirds layout that we put right here is commensurate with the drawing. And a lot of the time, somebody's likeness hides within this relationship between where the eyes line up, the brow lines up, the nose and the, and the mouth. So if you have something that looks really off, then it's usually one of these thirds issue that you're screwing up. So let's see if that's correct. From the brow to the forehead, from the brow to the nose, and from the nose to the chin, that's where the thirds line up, right? And for this guy, his face is dead on to the thirds, which is usually what you're going to be dealing with. But those subtle little nuances, you know, maybe the nose is just a bit longer, a bit shorter. Those, is, that's what creates somebody's character and their likeness. So you really want to be very, very sure that you got it correct. So you want to, you know, measure twice, cut once kind of thing. And the mouth usually hides halfway between the bottom of the nose to the chin. But for this guy, it looks like it's a little bit further up. A lot further up, in fact. It's more right around there. And again, we can, we can plot that. Yeah, and that's about correct. We're going to start actually modeling the main shapes of the face. And this is where it starts really turning more three-dimensional. So I don't, I'm not going to try to make everything perfect. I'm really going to just gesturally go in. Get the general idea, and then we can start checking and modeling, depending on that. But I can see that the, the eyes are, the eye sockets are generally like that. Yeah, and that lines up. Checking the relationships between how it horizontally lines up, you might also want to check out how it vertically lines up. So when I was talking about the plumb lines earlier, this is really important. So usually when you're drawing or painting, you have your reference, the thing that you're trying to draw, on the right side or the left side, depending on what your dominant hand is. And what you're doing is that you're only checking in the horizontal direction how things line up because it's it's situated like this. But what you can do every once in a while, and this is especially easy if you use a reference, is that you can actually place the reference above or below your drawing. And then you can check if they line up in this direction as well. And that's really, really critical because you can get pretty accurate measurements as far as measuring the portion, for example, like this, you know, you can get generally get the right thing. But if you're really struggling with a likeness and something's really not working for you, then I would highly suggest moving either your, your sitter or your drawing so that they can move in that direction. And then you can, you can plot out some issues there. Because what a lot of people do is that they'll get the horizontal correct, but the vertical is all screwed up. And when you use in tandem the vertical and the horizontal directions, it's like plotting a point on a graph. 
you know, you get your Y and you get your X and then eventually you can situate all the features correctly. But you need to make sure that you're, if you're having issues with accurate drawing, that you're taking advantage of both those options. All right, so squinting down, I can see that this shape, the left side of his face is really just a very dark almond kind of shape. So I'm just gonna put that down there. And this is kind of the very generalized idea of his face. And I'm gonna lay that in just as a general tone. And what's important when you're first beginning is to simplify it down into light and dark. That makes things a lot easier. Because you, I'm sure evil, you guys have all gone through early art classes where they talked about a value scale, one to seven, for example, something like that. And although that can help people conceptualize how values work a little bit easier, it's really not practical because you're not gonna be looking at a person saying, oh, that's about a five or something, you know. What you really wanna do is you wanna simplify it into light and dark when you're first starting out. And then you can check all your errors and you can get the foundation working right so that all the light and the dark uh, shapes are correct, drawing-wise, and then you can start messing with the values a little bit more, and that really helps. So what I'm gonna do right here is I'm not gonna add in, if I have a whole value spectrum, and I'm not gonna make it as dark as it can go because I won't be able to erase it, but let's say like it goes from light to dark, right? I'm not gonna be using every single value between the light and the dark because that's gonna, that's gonna complicate my drawing too much. It, drawing is really hard, and you wanna make it as simple as possible for yourself. So instead of using the whole spectrum here, I'm going to split it up into two. And I talked about this in another video of mine, but I'm just going to use light and dark, and I'm abstracting that out, right? So if I use, only use those two as values in the beginning, I'm not going to have to worry about all these subtle half tones and all this stuff that can, that can be details that derail your drawing accuracy-wise. And I'm just going to generally mark out the, uh, the jacket here. And humans are really good at determining when there's drawing issues with faces, but with things like trees and landscapes, and that's why a lot of people like landscape painting because it's easier. Uh, but with clothing and other things, it, it has to be generally correct, but you can actually get away with a lot more stuff because you're not biologically developed, you even, even psychologically evolved to see if there's an anatomical problem with a tree or if there's, uh, you didn't evolve to see if clothing was the correct proportion, right? But we have a very intuitive understanding of what looks right, what looks wrong on a face, but it's not the same for clothing, for example. So you can really be much looser with things that don't involve the face. And you can see that that's what Sargent always did on all of his clothing, is it was almost always really, really loose. So it's always just suggested. We know that on this clothing, for example, it's a really dark value. He's probably wearing a black suit, but Sargent didn't make it black, he made it white. And he just suggested some lines, and that's enough for our brain to understand what it is. And to understand how to suggest something in an abstract sense, and then also to have a more rendered realistic part of the drawing, and those two working together simultaneously, that's where you start getting to a more masterful level of drawing. So again, just getting the general proportion, you know, it really doesn't matter if you're getting it perfect that's kind of the shape of the tie you know and then we have this darker shape on the color side now for the eye socket here I'm just gonna be laying in a very light general tone and that's gonna help me kind of see if my shape is correct now the way Sergeant used his lines were really interesting too so when he uses lines the idea of a line is really just the deviation between two different value shapes or two different forms. Think about it like that. So if you have a, a desk and a chair, or actually let's make it less uh, complicated, a sphere and a cube, then, let's see like for this for example, where they overlap or where one meets with the background, people put an outline because we conceptually think about an object in the background is different and to suggest where this ends and this begins we use a line now you can also use lines as abstract representations of light hitting a form so if if light is hitting from this direction then I might make this a thicker line down here and then make this a thinner line up here 
And what that does is that it feels like there's light hitting this object without even rendering it at all. You're just using your lines. And Sargent was doing this. He was using this fundamental concept on the face, right? So what somebody more inexperienced might do is that they might take the edge of this ear, for example, and they might outline the hell out of it, make it really thick, make sure the entire thing is silhouetted, you know, with this really blocky outline. But what Sargent did is that he used the idea of light influencing the line width, and he made it, this is so light that there's no line at all. The line just disappears. And that makes it look a little bit more realistic because we can understand it as a concept and also as a physical phenomenon at the same time. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to replicate that because this is a study, of course. And I'm not going to try to change up his drawing. So I'm going to keep it dark down here where the, the light is hitting the form. And then when you go up, you just lose the line. It, it's not there. All right, so now I'm just gonna lay in the general mass. And if you know your foundation is right, don't be afraid to just lay in the mass. Just, if it's dark, draw it dark. Just put it in. So I'm using a little bit harder of a pencil, or less hard of a pencil, rather, B. And this is the, the Neutrum B. I'm not a sponsor or anything, I just like their charcoal. I'm going to use this softer charcoal for the darker accents, because you could technically get to a very dark state with just the H, but it's a lot more difficult because it's just not designed to go as dark, right? This is designed to go really dark. And that's why I like to do my construction lines with H, because what you're doing is that you're not going to have, if you do end up screwing up and you put some a mark down that you want to erase, it's not going to be stuck on the paper because it's so dark. So I like putting the construction lines with H and then putting in all the masses with B. So another interesting thing that Sargent would do with his charcoal drawings is that since he was a painter first and foremost, that influenced the way that he would draw. So when he was drawing, he wasn't drawing using lines, which is the typical way we might think about it. Because when you're drawing, you are filling in shade with multiple different lines. And that's why there's cross-hatching and all this other stuff. But the fundamental difference between drawing and painting is that with painting, you're using shapes to define form. And with drawing, you're using lines, generally speaking, even though you're using lines to make shapes, right? So one way to think about this <clears throat> as far as using charcoal is that when you're painting, you're using shapes, right? So what Sargent would do with his charcoal drawings is that he would use really blocky pieces of charcoal and he'd make big shapes. And that doesn't, that's a very thick line right there, right? And it, it's such a thick line that it's basically a shape. And he would have very shapely charcoal drawings. And although you, you could see a lot of modeling with the H's, for example, but a lot of the time he would use those shapes to define the form. So as you can see, as I was talking about earlier, that was really dark, and now I realize that it's actually, it was a mistake, right? This was supposed to be light. And what happened was there's a lot of residual charcoal there that's really hard to get rid of because it's stuck on the paper. It was so dark. So this is why you should do your construction lines with a less dark pencil. With oil painting and other painting mediums, there's always a back button. You know, you can scrape it off, you can rework it, you can paint over it, you know. And you can even make it look like it's fresh and new and you can do anything and screw up. But uh, drawing is much more unforgiving medium. And there's positives and there's negatives to that. But one of the negatives is obviously what just happened. The sergeant would do, and this is what Zorn did as well, is that he'd have a certain movement to his paintings and also to his drawings. And the way that you create movement is through a lot of curves and motion. So if I want the viewer to think that the, the suit is going wrapping around the shoulder and coming down like this, then I'm going to be using a lot of downward stroking motions when I'm actually rendering it. And what that does is that it creates that sense of movement. And, you know, Sargent did a little bit less than Zorn, and especially Van Gogh. He was really known for that. But creating motion is all about having multiple curves that are 
following the same sort of path. And so Sergeant's doing that a little bit with this this suit right here. Because he could have gone in all different directions and cross-hatched it, but it would have ruined the motion of this picture. Hey guys, so <clears throat> also what I'm gonna be doing as a video in the future is I'm gonna be critiquing, critiquing some people's work and I'm gonna take an amalgam of multiple people and I'm gonna put it as just, you know, one after the other and we're gonna go through them and we're all gonna learn a little bit more. Uh, if you'd wanna be included in that little critique video where I look at your work and I can tell you what you're doing well, what you're doing poorly, uh, then go to my Instagram and DM me and give me some of your work and then I can include you. So if you're interested in getting a critique and I can publish it and you can watch it and hopefully, you know, we'll become a better, better artist because of it, then go to my Instagram. I'll link it in the bio and DM me some of your work. Now what Surgeon would also do, and we can see this in multiple locations throughout the drawing, is that he would get the general masses in. And then when he was finished, when he was refining, he would add in darker lines essentially with the B. And what that would do is that it would define the face a little bit better. So you can see on the edge here, it's a soft edge, but within there, there's, I don't know if it picks up on camera, but there's a darker line within that. So what that does is that it, it's like lining out the form, but it doesn't make it too sharp for the eye. Cause being a little bit too sharp for the eye can almost feel like it's, it's cutting something, you know, it's just a little too much. But if you can do it subtly, like the way that he's doing it right here, then it's gonna look appealing. Now, Sergeant was also known for, <clears throat> if he got a likeness off, he felt like it wasn't really working out, it didn't look precise enough, you know, the likeness was off. If that was so, then he was known for just starting right over again, throwing away the canvas, not, not moving an eye up or down, but just throwing out the whole thing and restarting. And much like in life, you know, it's a very good strategy. If somebody is extremely toxic, you need to cut them out of your life. If you're in a situation that doesn't serve you, you need to leave that situation. If your drawing's not working out, stop complicating and just throw it out and restart. So one of the things that Sergeant would always do, and he was a master, he was one of the best portrait painters of all time, if not the best. And even he would screw up a lot of the time and he'd have to restart. So don't be so arrogant as to not be able to just admit defeat on one drawing and then just to restart, to pursue and pull through with a better drawing in the end because you decided that it wasn't good enough and you just had to restart. Now when Sergeant was doing his really, really subtle half tones, <clears throat> what you'd see a lot is a lot of these really soft hatching marks on the face. So for example, over here by the cheek, you can see the little inklings of the hatching. And that means that Sergeant wasn't blending it all out. You don't want to blend your entire drawing. It's, that's going to ruin it. But also what he was doing is that he would hatch in the way that the form of the skin would curl over. So the cheek we know has this kind of round shape that rounds over the eye right here. So he would hatch in that direction, just like how the suit would go down, so he'd hatch down. He was thinking about how the motion would describe the form. So that's one thing to think about as well when you're doing a portrait. All right, you guys, thanks for coming along. I'm gonna be releasing part two really, really soon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the same concepts, a little bit more about modeling and how to really bring home the drawing in the final stages. So I hope you enjoyed your stay. I look forward to hearing from you guys in the comments and talking to you guys later. So all the best. Go make something beautiful and see you later.